All right. Well, uh, people are still pouring in. Um, please close the door quietly as you come through. Um, and uh, my name's Tim Reid. I'm one of the Victorian Greens MPs. Uh, welcome to our Climate Action and Green New Deal webinar. We've got uh, three speakers here already, Ellen Sandell, Shane Rattenbury and Trent McCarthy. I'll introduce them shortly. Um, but as you come in, please make sure that your microphone's off. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to kick off now. Um, so I'm the MC. Thank you all for, for joining us today. Uh, it's great to have so many people here. And so I'm going to start now by acknowledging the traditional owners of the various lands on which we're all meeting. I acknowledge that we're all on stolen land and that sovereignty has never been ceded. Um, I'm on Wurundjeri country here, uh, but you may wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands you're in, in the chat box. So uh, make sure you can find the chat box. We're recording today's proceedings, uh, but if it's okay with you, we'd love everyone to keep their cameras on if possible so that we can see your faces. This helps us keep things engaging and interactive and it will help our speakers to feel like they're speaking to an audience. Uh, but if your internet's dodgy or you're uh, wrangling a child uh, or you don't want to be seen, then obviously feel free to turn your camera off. Uh, and a reminder, microphones off, please. Um, we don't want feedback issues. So we really want this webinar to be interactive. We need to hear from you. Uh, we want your feedback, uh, so please use the public chat, which you can find through the little menu at the bottom of the Zoom window. Type in your comments, uh, as well as any questions. We've got moderators who will take questions from the chat box, which I will ask our speakers during the Q&A, and we've got lots of time for questions and answers after our three speakers. They're each giving uh, fairly short speeches. Um, or Tim, presentations. sorry to, sorry to yep. interrupt you. Um, I think you need to move the slides along. We're still stuck on the first slide. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, uh, thanks for reminding me of that. So, where were we? So, welcome to this discussion about how we can uh, drive climate solutions as part of the COVID recovery at a state level in Victoria. Uh, we've got ideas, but we also want your ideas and your feedback. Now, we've invited Shane Rattenbury from the ACT and Trent McCarthy from Darabin Council here to show what is possible at not just state and territory, but at local level. Um, and they'll be joining Ellen Sandell, Greens MP for Melbourne, and uh, Victorian Green spokesperson on climate and energy uh, to discuss these issues. So between the three of them, their huge depth of work and experience uh, means that we can add your comments to that and to our policy work to advocate for real solutions for Victoria. So today's session won't be talking so much about federal level issues and responses, important though they are. So I'm going to um, introduce our speakers properly. Uh, so, first of all, Shane Rattenbury is Minister for Climate and Energy uh, in the ACT, which has a sort of combined state and local government. Trent McCarthy, who's been a long time councillor on Darabin Council, and Ellen Sandell, who I've referred to already. Uh, and I'd like to hand over now to, um, to Shane. So, Shane, if you've got 10 minutes or so, you'll need to unmute and just tell me when you want me to advance the slides. Well, thanks very much, Tim, and good afternoon, everybody. It's great to join you from Ngunnawal country here in the ACT, the traditional custodians of this area. Today, I thought I'd just talk about how the ACT has transitioned to 100% renewable electricity and what that has meant in terms of economic benefits for the territory. This is a prime time to be having this conversation as we emerge from the COVID pandemic and we look at where the world is going, uh, the enormous issues of economic downturn and unemployment that are facing our communities, we are putting the case very clear that now is the time to build a better normal. We cannot simply snap back to the normal that we had before. That normal was unsustainable. It was driving the climate crisis. And it is a time to, to reflect on what we've learned from the COVID period and to create a better future going forward for ourselves. 
we think the ACT is a living example of how you can do this and some of the benefits that it does bring. So thanks, Tim. Um, way back in 2008 now, the ACT Greens, for which I'm one of the members of the Assembly, I won the balance of power in the Territory Parliament and we negotiated a parliamentary agreement with the Labor Party. One of the key things in that was that we wanted to commit to the ACT reducing its greenhouse gas emissions by 40% by 2020. And that was really important because what it did was set that long-term goal and then require us to think about how we were going to get there. One of the key things in that was deciding to move to 100% renewable electricity. And over time, we've conducted a series of large scale reverse auctions to buy that power. Uh, each of those auctions has been able to secure that power at the lowest prices available in Australia at the time. And part of that has been governments standing there saying, we've got a commitment to doing this, we'll provide certainty, we'll provide a 20 year contract. And that has given the developers the opportunity to know that they can get a long term economic return, whilst at the same time providing power at the most competitive prices that have been seen. We've also, as part of that, made sure the community has been involved. And there is a one megawatt community solar farm that has been, is about to start being built as part of those processes. And I think that's very important to give people an opportunity who don't have home solar uh, to participate in this process. And that household and rooftop solar has been an important part of us achieving our target. Uh, the ACT from the 1st of January this year has been powered by 100% renewable electricity. Uh, and we will meet this year that 40% emissions reduction target that we set ourselves way back in 2008. And I think an important part of that story is, as I said earlier, having a long-term target, having the political will to do it, and then just getting on with it. We've got some hard work to do now. We want to be uh, net zero emissions by 2045, and we've now got to tackle our transport and natural gas sectors. But we're in a position to do that because we've achieved our electricity emission reductions, and now we can start focusing on those other sectors. Uh, thanks, Tim. This next slide just shows you uh, where our resources are. The ACT doesn't have great wind resources itself, uh, but those contracts have been let in other parts of the country. And my favourite one in this group is the Sapphire Wind Farm up in the north of New South Wales there, which is actually Barnaby Joyce's electorate. Uh, and it's created jobs and economic opportunity in all of these regional areas. And when Bar Barnaby came out and said uh, that the ACT was crazy, for going to this 100% target. I don't think he saw the irony of the fact that we were creating jobs and economic opportunity in his own electorate. Uh, thanks very much, Tim. Let me turn to the economic benefits, because I think that's really the focus of today's seminar and, and underlines the importance of putting these policies in place and the opportunities it delivers, because it's not all about cost, it's actually a lot about opportunity. The reverse auctions that we've undertaken will attract more than $500 million in local investment over the 20 year life of those contracts. And this is coming in a number of forms. Under each of those contracts and reverse auctions, we required the companies to make a local investment in the ACT in various forms. And we've seen that take a number of guises. So one of them has been that a number of the companies have set their headquarters up here in the ACT. So in the city, we've got four national and international wind companies that have their headquarters here. It's created dozens of local jobs, and it started to create an ecosystem of expertise, which I'll touch on a little bit more in my, com in my comments. They've also funded a battery storage rollout program, uh, and we are now rolling out household batteries across the ACT, up to 36 megawatts. To put 36 megawatts in context, and don't mind the bells, it's parliamentary sitting day here, but I'm not required to dash out. Um, 36 megawatts is about a third of the size of the big battery in South Australia. So it gives you a sense of, um, that was my staff checking that I don't have to dash out, but it's okay, but I'm paired for this discussion. Um, it's about a third of the size of the big battery in South Australia. Uh, moving along, thanks, Tim. And sorry about that noise, I'll just keep trying to talk over the top of it. But um, other, other projects that have been started include a partnership with and Neon, who are one of our wind farm generators, Hyundai and our local gas company on hydrogen vehicles. And so that will include the ACT government receiving 20 hydrogen vehicles into our government fleet and also building Australia's first publicly accessible hydrogen refuelling station, which should be completed in the next few months. It's been slowed down a little bit because of COVID, 
uh, because we need some American technicians to come out and we all know the travel restrictions. Uh, but uh, that will be underway later this year. We've also started a renewable energy innovation fund, which we're able to provide grants out of. The companies who did our contracts injected that money. And I spoke earlier about that ecosystem. Through that, we've set up a renewables innovation hub where we've got small startups can get cheap rent to come and all work together in you know, a single building. And it's meant that that sort of cross fertilization is going along. And we've also now got the distributed energy resources laboratory at the ANU. This has also been funded out of some of the money that came from the contracts and all of these things have built up that group knowledge here in the ACT. We also had Australia's first a globally accredited wind training program being offered through our local CIT. And all of these things have flowed from the fact that we put the contracts in place, started to build the expertise, and as that's gone on, more and more of the companies have uh, put the headquarters in the ACT, started to invest in each other, and created those opportunities to uh, share expertise across the city. Now, in all of this, what I can also tell you is that we've just had our latest electricity price determination. And from yesterday, when the new electricity prices kicked in, we have the cheapest electricity in Australia. So you can do all of this without bringing about significant costs. And as I've outlined, also creates significant economic opportunity. So let me leave my remarks there. I'm conscious this bill is probably quite distracting, but also want to leave plenty of time for questions. So I look forward to the discussion later on and I'm now going to mute myself. Trent, thank you very much. The, the bill was barely noticeable at, at this end. Um, and th that's an extraordinary achievement, uh, what you can get with, with Greens in power uh, in Canberra. And it's just so good to know that when Scott Morrison turns on his laptop, he's running on 100% renewable energy. So um, now I'm just gonna try, and I'm having a bit of trouble moving the slides. Here we go. Um, I'd now like to introduce Councillor Trent McCarthy from Darabin Council who most of you probably know, uh, but uh, Darabin will forever be famous in climate action. Uh, take it away, Trent. Thanks, Tim. And um, I'd like to echo your um, acknowledgement of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and also recognise all the traditional owners across all the lands on which we gathered here today and that sovereignty was never ceded. Um, in making that acknowledgement, I also make that acknowledgement um, on the understanding that it's, it's actually traditional knowledge that I think will help us repair and restore our ecological environment over coming years and decades if we can get both the politics right and, um, and connect with as much of the community as we can. Um, on the other side of the other part of the great emergency that we face, of course, is the climate emergency. And I've been on Darabin City Council since 2008. Um, Shane and I were actually elected to our respective roles within about a month of each other. Um, so I wouldn't say that there's a, a race between Darabin and the ACT, um, but I just did, so there we go. So we're always trying to um, challenge what governments can do. And we've both had the, uh, I suppose, the benefit of being in a position to actually implement Greens policy on the ground. And for me, that's been a profound privilege because what it's meant is that when we talk about um, getting solar on the rooftops of our disadvantaged and low-income households, um, we've had a chance to do that and to do that at scale. Um, and we've really started to reach beyond our local areas. Um, thanks, Tim. So I'll just jump to the next slide there. Thank you. Um, so just to give some context, um, I mentioned before about getting solar on the roofs of our um, low-income households and in including our pensioners. And, one of the things that um, I was able to do when I was the only Greens uh, councillor at Darabin, which was the case for the first eight years of my time on council, was to find a way to get um, a thing called Solar Saver up and running, which is a, a program that basically puts solar on the roofs of, of pensioner households initially, and now if anyone, um, with no upfront costs. And this was critical because it was all about removing both the financial barriers for people to be part of that solar revolution, um, but to also generate local jobs, jobs that were often providing a, a revenue stream for uh, small to medium businesses that were either in the installation or the manufacturing space, or even the community engagement space. And we have literally created hundreds of jobs through this program over the past uh, decade or so. 
Um, solar saver is, um, I like to refer to it as the nonner effect. So it effectively um, works on the notion that uh, if you get one Italian grandmother in reservoir, and that was where the, we had the highest penetration of this um, particular program, um, she becomes so proud of her solar on her roof that she tells all of her neighbours and suddenly we get this um, rolling effect across an entire suburb. And so that's why we've seen massive solar uptake um, in communities that otherwise might not have been part of um, this particular solar revolution. Fast forward to 2016 and Darabin became the first city in the world to declare a climate emergency. And that there in front of you is our climate emergency plan, just a, a bit of a shape of it. And it, it might not be easy to see uh, on screen there, but that, uh, that sort of chart there that you can see on the left hand side um, is a depiction of our emissions. And what was really important is that in declaring a climate emergency, we knew we needed to go beyond talking about what was required, but actually talking about who needed to act. And this enabled us to make the case to say that the vast majority of our emissions in Darabin um, were actually outside of the power of um, both council and often the individual residents. And so we needed to mobilise significant action, unprecedented action at other levels of government. We also had to go forward with a message of hope. And that was the notion that it is possible to restore a safe climate. Um, we need to uh, maintain that message, but we need to also see that mass mobilisation and that's what we're really proud of doing. And critical to that is actually the restructuring of the economy at scale and speed. So it's, it's wonderful to have that sort of language in a council document. It's another thing to put it into action. Uh, thanks, Tim. So we set some very specific objectives as part of this and key to that was about mobilisation and leadership. And critical to that as well was about building community resilience. And all we have to do is look at what's happened over recent months to understand how important it is for people to be connected, whether or not um, governments uh, are acting or not, the community needs to stay together, stick together, work together and have a common focus. And one of the things that for me is really striking is that as we connect people into that course of action, um, what is possible in the response to a climate emergency and towards a Green New Deal um, becomes very real for people. So once someone has solar on their roof or they manage to put a battery on, on their property or they start thinking about sharing their energy with their neighbours, suddenly they have that sense of agency. And that, as, as Greens members, we know that um, fully, but it's something profoundly different to actually get people to experience that directly. So I think for me, it's all about connecting people into action all the time and advocating for system change. Uh, thanks, Tim. One thing that um, you may or may not know is that we have this fantastic model of mobilisation in Victoria. Um, it says there that 70 out of 79 councils are parts of uh, regional alliances to address climate change, known as greenhouse alliances. In fact, it's now all 79 councils, which is fantastic. And these councils have worked together for, in some cases, for two decades, um, creating local projects, renewable energy generation, energy efficiency, community connectedness. Um, what we have seen, and in every one of those um, climate alliances, there are projects that have actually delivered real jobs for local people and a real um, transition towards a renewable energy future. One of the things that's striking is that when we've had conservative governments or governments that are slow to act on climate change um, in Victoria, these climate alliances have kept going. And in fact, they underpin the sort of structures that we'll need under a Green New Deal model, which is how do we enable communities wherever they are in Victoria actually be able to be part of that conversation, be part of that action, and be part of that change. Thanks, Tim. Um, so one thing that we have done, and, and this is something, this is a project that Darabin Council has um, funded and led over the last couple of years, is to effectively mobilise local governments together. So we've brought about 48 councils together, um, effectively 1,000 people across the state to build the largest procurement of renewable energy um, in the country of any government alliance. This is going to result in 250 gigawatts of gigawatt hours of new renewable energy, most likely a combination of wind and solar. And it actually accounts for 45% of all the electricity consumed by local governments in this state. It's the equivalent, as you can see there, of taking 47,000 homes, 87,000 cars off the fossil fuel grid which for us is a profound example of what state governments should do. The fact that a little council in Melbourne's northern suburbs led this project, funded this project, 
and got a range of councils together, including some of our most conservative councils come together, um, for me is, is a, an example of what a Green New Deal is all about. It's actually about bringing people into the mix and, and actually delivering an agenda, which is about renewables, it's about jobs. And in every single case, every single council is also saving money, which means more money for libraries, childcare, those sorts of um, activities that are really important to connecting a community. Thanks, Tim. Um, so one of the things that's happened in the last year, and um, Shane's been part of this journey with me as well, is recognising that we now have uh, 1,737 governments around the world that have declared a climate emergency, which started here in Melbourne at the city of Darabin. It also means that we've got 96 governments in Australia and 32 of those are in Victoria. So we set about how do we actually bring them together to actually create an alliance that builds that public pressure, builds that pressure within government and within industry to deliver that, what we would describe here as a Green New Deal, but it, in, in broader terms, is really that significant transition to a renewable energy future and mass action on the climate emergency. Um, so Climate Emergency Australia is uh, on the brink of being publicly launched. So you're getting it a bit of an exclusive. Um, we have brought together these councils and the ACT government um, through Shane has been involved in this too, to build a commitment to work together, to mobilise our power and to look at whether it's the advocacy work we have to do, or whether it's the massive projects to deliver the change that we need. And for me, that map is just a striking example of communities just getting on with it. Um, and for me, that's what the Greens have been part of for such a long time. Thanks, Tim. Um, lastly, I just wanted to touch on this. And for me, this is also part of the wonderful work that our state MPs do. And it's where the alliance between local government and state, state um, uh, Greens MPs and, uh, and, and even federal Greens MPs as well are able to deliver real change to the actual structures that influence people's lives. So here on the um, on one side of this uh, page, you can see Greta Thunberg in 2018, um, basically having her first protest on the steps of her parliament. In exactly the same month in Victoria, the state government uh, basically updated its Planning and Environment Act. And if you do a word search of this act, there is not a single reference to climate change. Now this is the act that actually defines and describes the rules for which um, all development happens in Victoria. It also sets up the framework for the protection of our environment. So for me, this is a striking example of where a piece of legislation that should be all about action on the climate emergency um, completely misses the point. And for, it's, it's wonderful that just about a week ago, we had the launch of Planners Declare, which is the alliance of um, local planners who have come together and said they have a massive role to play in action on the climate emergency. So we are starting to see sectors that previously were very much um, neutral to being involved in these public policy debates coming out and saying, we've had enough, we need to see this action at state and federal levels as well as local council. I'll end it there, thank you. Trent, thank you very much. Uh, wonderful to know what can be done at local government, uh, a much underappreciated sector of public administration. So we go now to Ellen Sandell, um, who, unmute yourself, Ellen, is uh, gonna tell us about what's happening in the Victorian state political situation. Thanks, Ellen. Thank you. Um, excellent presentations, Shane and Trent. I thought everyone might just wanna have a little bit of a stretch before we get onto a different topic. It's a bit unnatural um, sitting in front of a computer all day. Okay. So thank you so much for being here. I'm going to talk about what we're proposing at a Victorian state level when it comes to the climate crisis and how we believe climate action can build us out of recession, the COVID recession here in Victoria. Now I've put this quote here from Milton Friedman, whatever you think of Milton Friedman, I think this is a valuable quote, which is that only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. And when a crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. And we are in a crisis right now. We had a crisis with the bushfires over New Year's, and then piled on top of that, we've had the COVID crisis, which is not just a health crisis, but an economic crisis that is shaking up everything we know about the economy and society. And things that were never possible before, that we never thought governments would do, like free childcare, like increasing the job seeker payment, um, these things that we thought governments would never do, 
they've done them because we're in a crisis. And so the challenge for the Greens and people who believe that we need fast climate action now is, our challenge is to make sure that when governments are in this mode of having to deal with a crisis and picking up bold ideas, that the bold ideas that are lying around are our ideas, the ones that are good for dealing with inequality and dealing with the climate crisis, not bad ideas like $25,000 for granite bench top grants or uh, propping up the coal and gas industry. So this is our challenge, but it is also an incredible opportunity that we wouldn't wish this crisis upon anyone, but now that we're in this crisis, can we use it as an opportunity to build a better normal that also deals with climate change while creating jobs? Thanks, Tim. Next slide. So we've had some incredible climate wins in Victoria over the last little while. Someone just put in the chat before that the Labor and Liberals don't like to do things that are Greens ideas. Well, I've actually had the, the opposite experience that when we came into um, winning our first lower house seats in 2014, we took a number of climate initiatives to that election, which we put a lot of pressure on the government. And because they looked like they were losing a lot of seats to the Greens, they actually implemented some of these things. So the Victorian Renewable Energy Target, that was a policy we took to the election, something that we did a lot of policy development on, a lot of work with experts at the University of Melbourne to show how it could be done, very similar to the reverse auction model that was happening in the ACT. And the Victorian government for a long time said, no, no, we could never do it, we could never do it. And then at the last second, oh yes, we're going to do it. And so that's excellent that the Andrews government has adopted that policy for a renewable energy target. And we've actually built, um, five or six projects, big uh, renewable energy projects across Victoria through that system, through one auction round. Um, the Victorian government's done some other really good things, um, new powers to fix up the grid, usurping the old, uh, really outdated laws at a federal level, Victoria is going it alone to fix up the grid, and also solar for homes. There were a lot of comments in the chat about getting solar on people's homes and how good that is. Well, in Victoria, we have a very generous grants scheme of around $2,000 if you put solar on your home, um, probably the most generous solar grants scheme we've ever seen in this country. Um, and we've also just in the last few weeks seen the government commit to solar for all Victorian schools, which is something that, again, the Greens worked on for a very long time, um, pushing the government to put solar on schools for the numerous benefits that it provides, and the government has just announced that. So we are seeing the Andrews government take some really good, bold steps, put some serious money behind this, and we're very uh, happy that they're going in that direction. Next slide, Tim. And James, yeah, great. Um, and this is just a slide that shows you where the renewable energy projects through the VRET have been built in Victoria. And Mahir, I'll just get you to moot. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tim. Next slide. So this is just uh, a slide about Vic putting solar on all Victorian schools, which have been very happy, has been achieved in the last few weeks. Next slide, Tim. But of course, it's not all good news. While this Andrews Labor government is uh, pretty good when it comes to renewable energy, unfortunately, they're not very good when it comes to fossil fuels. And we know that you can't just build renewable energy without also phasing out fossil fuels because coal and gas and logging is what is driving climate change. So unfortunately in Victoria, we have no plan to get out of coal and we do have the three dirtiest power stations in the country right here in, the, in Victoria. Uh, the Labor government has opened up the whole state to new gas drilling, which will be a disaster for the climate. Uh, that when they did that, they actually said that it was totally forgot fine because they forgot to count the emissions that are released when you burn that gas. So they're relying on some pretty shoddy science when it comes to promoting their gas agenda. They're also supporting a, a gas import ship in Western Port. So importing fracked gas from potentially Queensland and the Northern Territory to be burnt here in Victoria, which is again a disaster. They're, because of COVID, they've delayed a whole bunch of decisions like their emission reduction targets they were supposed to decide on, they've delayed them. Uh, their plan for capping some of the worst pollution out of our power stations, delayed. They're putting our taxpayer money into a very dirty coal project 
and of course they're still logging our native forests. So unfortunately it is not all good news in Victoria and we are miles behind jurisdictions like the ACT when it comes to taking climate change seriously. Next slide, Tim. So what does that mean for us? Where are we headed and where are the opportunities to make change? In Victoria, we're calling as the Greens for a renewables-led recovery, a Green New Deal, if you will, which is a plan to deal with climate change and the COVID economic crisis at the same time, to create jobs by building renewable energy infrastructure and other projects, which we know will create jobs immediately. Next slide. So what are some of the things that could be in a renewables-led recovery that we have the opportunity to do right now in Victoria that would make the most difference? Well, one of them is that Victoria could actually host Australia's first offshore wind farm. There's one proposed off the coast of Gippsland, the Star of the South. If it was built, it would power almost 20% of Victoria's electricity, which would be remarkable. And it just needs some legislation change and regulation change because it is a new industry. But we've seen these all around the world in places like Scotland, for example, been very successful. And in fact, the unions down in the Latrobe Valley are calling for this to be built because they see it as a way to help us transition out of those jobs in coal in the Latrobe Valley to energy jobs that are still in Gippsland but in clean energy. Next slide. What else could it involve? Well, it could actually involve completely reviving manufacturing. We know that so much manufacturing in Victoria was based on the fact that we had very cheap energy because we had this pretty much free coal energy here in Victoria. Um, Marcus has just pointed out, I should say smelter, not shelter. Very correct. Uh, so we have uh, not that much manufacturing left in Victoria, which actually is the same. And Often people might say, oh, I would have thought the Greens would be calling on something like our aluminium in Smelter in Portland closed down because it is so energy intensive. It use about, uses about 10% of Victoria's energy, which is huge, and that's mostly coal energy. So it is actually three times dirtier. That aluminium that's produced is three times dirtier than any aluminium that's produced around the world. because It, just, it uses coal energy, which is so incredibly dirty. But we're not saying shut it down. What we're saying is, why don't we clean it up? We know that the government actually already subsidises this smelter. We already give them about $50 million a year. And it's quite secretive what uh, the conditions are attached to that. But why don't we give them that same amount of money to actually upgrade, to be powered by renewable energy, but also act as a kind of reverse battery where on very hot days, when everyone's turning on their air conditioners, the smelter could actually have the technology, which exists in places like Norway and Canada, to actually reduce their energy use, free up energy in the grid, so we don't have to turn on those gas peaking plants, we don't have to use that coal energy, reduces prices for everyone, better for the planet, and we keep those jobs in clean manufacturing, which is what we need. I see it as a win-win-win-win. Next slide, please. What else could we do? Well, I noticed some um, people in the chat talking about energy efficiency and how actually it can be more efficient to do energy efficiency than building renewable energy. And yes, in some cases it can, but we live in virtually pretty much glorified tents in Melbourne <laughs> and across Victoria. Our homes are terribly poorly insulated. They're quite badly built. They're not very efficient and people are having to spend thousands to get them up to scratch so that they're not so uncomfortable and cold, particularly in winter and boiling hot in summer. So why don't we create new jobs in actually keeping our homes comfortable and affordable uh, by uh, insulation, draft proofing, um, replacing dangerous and old gas heaters, which are actually killing people in some cases through poisoning with solar heat pumps and uh, split systems, which we know are much, much more efficient. Thanks, Tim. Next slide. And why don't we put solar and batteries on, sorry, just back to the other one, the public housing one. Why don't we put solar and batteries on every public housing home? We've done it on schools now, which was a great step forward. We're putting them on private residences. What about people who live in public housing? 
they don't have control over whether they can do it themselves because they're renting from the government. So why don't we say the government puts solar and batteries on every public housing home, drives down prices of energy for the people who are doing it the most tough, who, who need lower energy bills, and it also then creates a bit of a grid st stabilisation for the rest of us. Next slide, Tim. And we also know we need to do some of the harder things, which is things like building an energy system that is up to scratch for the 21st century and beyond. Uh, we actually have a pretty poor grid here in Victoria. There are parts of our grid that have not been upgraded in a long time. And there's actually a lot of solar and wind projects in Western Victoria that want to get started, but can't because the grid is full and it hasn't been upgraded. So why don't we upgrade our grid? But more than that, why don't we actually bring it back into public hands? Why don't we say that, why are we letting big energy corporations create heaps of profit for themselves and their, their overseas billionaire owners? Why isn't that value being given to every Victorian? The grid is essentially a natural monopoly. The monopoly shouldn't be in private hands, it should be in public hands. Next slide, thanks, Tim. So we know all of this is possible. Um, I'm not giving you the policy detail on every single bit of the Green New Deal. You can read that on our website. But we have done a lot of that policy thinking. And we know how many jobs it would create. We know how much roughly it will cost. We know that it is actually possible. And the government in Victoria has actually already set aside $24 billion of borrowings to lead us out of the COVID recession. And now the choice is, how do we spend that 24 billion? Are we spending it on granite bench top grants or equivalent? Are we spending it on building gas plants or coal to hydrogen plants or gas drilling across the state? Are we giving it to the pokies industry or the racing industry? Or are we actually using it for a Green New Deal that creates jobs and deals with the climate crisis at the same time? That's what I think we should do. We've got a plan to make it happen and that's what we'll be pursuing through the Victorian Parliament. And we know that it's possible because the government's already adopted so many of our ideas. So here's a few more that we're leaving lying around for them to pick up in creating a Green New Deal and getting us out of recession. Thanks, Tim. All right, thank you very much, Ellen. So um, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen in a second. And I believe we're going to a little poll because we wanna ask you some questions now. Uh, so keep putting your questions into the chat uh, and I'll be reading those out shortly, but here comes our poll. Now I'm gonna stop screen sharing here. So, Hopefully we can see uh, quite a lot of the audience and they're real people, not just teenagers from TikTok. So let's go with this poll now. All right, so we're looking at the poll results now. Um, James, can everybody see these poll results? Great. Yes, so as you can see uh, from these poll results, 63% um, of people who voted uh, indicated all of them equally, uh, as there are a myriad of things that we should be doing to help our government get out of uh, this COVID recovery phase. Um, I'll launch another poll now, a follow-up one. Fantastic. So in your opinion, what is the most important thing the government should do on energy policy coming out of COVID? James, I think both polls came up at once. So I think people have answered both of them already. Ah, I think okay. you are correct, yes. 
thanks for that. Back to you, Tim. All right, so, well, it looks like um, stopping logging uh, and improving carbon drawdown was the, uh, uh, the winner there, uh, but um, I suspect a, a lot of these things would have, would have been appealing for most people as well. So, um, well, that's, that's really ever interesting, everybody. It's great to get that kind of quantitative feedback. Let's go now to some, some of the interesting questions that people have put up. Uh, so I'm gonna just move these around on my screen so I can see you and see the questions as well. Um, and so you might wanna to switch to speaker view. So uh, you can find that in the top right corner of your Zoom window. Um, and I've got a, uh, a question here from Ryan Hodgman. Um, As a tenant in an apartment block, I've been wondering how to invest in a local solar microgrid. Could you share any links to those startups? Okay, so that's something we can put in the chat. Um, but uh, Katie Clements has also asked about uh, microgrids uh, illustrated in the film 2040, which if you haven't seen, you should. Trent, do you want to just tell us, do you know anything about microgrids and uh, is that something that you've looked at in Darabin? Yes, um, thanks Tim. Uh, this is a big passion of mine um, as well. One of the challenges that we have in Victoria is that the um, we have a, a, a tripartite arrangement with um, both the poles and wires companies, the retailers and the consumers of electricity and, uh, and the producers. And what this means is that um, the, the actual structure in Victoria for electricity um, and for energy in general um, actually works against the establishment of microgrids. So we've run a couple of pilot programs in Darabin. Um, one of them is a community led program uh, and project in Elkington. And there's another one um, that's looking at, at solar on the um, roof of a, a tram depot. And one of the challenges is that you, in order under current Victorian law to get a microgrid in place, you actually um, in most cases need to get the retailer, uh, sorry, and the poles and wire company to actually come on board with that, which means that you're actually putting it in the hands of private sector interests to determine whether a community can actually make that switch in that direction. So this is an opportunity for um, rapid legislative reform to unlock the microgrid as an opportunity. We have communities that want to um, share energy to do exactly what we've seen in films like 2040, um, and the Victorian legislation makes it um, almost impossible, not completely impossible, but, but incredibly difficult. And uh, so that's an opportunity for us all to get behind our Greens MPs as they advocate for that sort of um, uh, change in direction. Yes, yeah, so and we've been advocating for a change in the laws to make community energy much easier. Um, it is quite complex, um, but essentially, if you're a tiny little community group, you're treated like a big coal fired power station under the law. Uh, so it's, it's virtually impossible, very onerous in the very least, that get projects up off the ground. Um, there are some other options for renters, which are things like the government has uh, released a plan where if you're a landlord and a tenant, you each pay a third of your solar and the government will chip in a third and then the tenant can help pay that back through their energy bill savings. So if you have a amenable tenant and landlord, you can actually access some government funding to put solar up. Um, but it is a little bit limiting because you do need them to agree. So we've also proposed some solutions such as solar farms where tenants could actually buy into a solar project, say on a library or a community centre, and then get that credited to their bill. So we're continuing to pursue that through the parliament. It would also work for apartment owners who aren't able to put solar on their apartments. Some apartments can, some apartments can't. I don't know, Shane, if you've had any luck with things like renters or community solar in the ACT. Thanks, Alan. Certainly in terms of things like microgrids, we because we're a state government as well, in a sense, we've been able to change those rules. So a couple of years ago, we did enable so that apartment blocks and that, for example, can become one system connected to the grid rather than, say, 150 apartments connected. Uh, and I think the other part of this, which has come up a bit in the chat today as well, is that issue of sort of small scale storage. Uh, and I think that there's a real opportunity, and it's becoming much clearer that it's a place where I think we're going to see development, is not in individual household batteries or large scale batteries, but actually sort of a community scale battery uh, amongst you know, a couple of hundred households or a couple of dozen households and the like. And I think I'm anticipating that's where we're gonna see a lot more development in the next few years. 
Great. So you, you've effectively answered a bunch of questions from Chris, Lisa and Cass as well, who've asked about how can we get free solar panels like they do in New South Wales? Um, how accessible are solar power solutions to renters? And uh, what's the next step for households after you know, individual solar? Um, so before we move on from that, were there any final comments from any of you on that? on those issues? Just in Ellen? terms of solar, you, you can essentially get free solar in Victoria. So there are grants of almost $2,000. Uh, there's some criteria, your house has to be worth less than a certain amount, you have to be earning less than a certain amount, but it's quite generous. And you can essentially, the part that you pay, so you get $2,000 essentially free from the government, but the rest that you pay is actually an interest-free loan that then you can pay back through savings on your uh, energy bill and it's really modelled off the program that Darabin and Trent pioneered around solar savers. So that is possible in Victoria if you meet the criteria. I'll just add to that, thanks Alan, um, that one of the things that um, we've experimented with is with um, housing co-ops. Uh, so we've got a thing called the Northcote uh, Thornbury Community Housing Co-op who came together and, and effectively all agreed to um, have their rent increased by about 5% um, and in return they managed to negotiate the installation of solar across um, 38 properties. And what it meant was that they actually ended up all being in front because they reduced their electricity bills significantly and they did a lot of energy efficiency work, which is the other part of the equation here. It's not just about energy generation, it's also about um, energy savings. And, uh, and, and we need to invest in, in energy efficiency as much as we do in re renewables production. But we've, that, that particular model, um, is a model that we're now trying to get real estate agents to get on board with and have mass groups of uh, renters who can come on board together and make that switch to renewables um, and create the, the environment that landlords really want to say yes to it, which is part of the challenge is this, what we call the split incentive. So there are solutions, but we need state government action. And that's why the work that Alan does is so important in the, in the parliament. That's great. And that also answers a question from Anthony about uh, the importance of thermal efficiency in buildings. So uh, let's move on. I want to uh, grab a question here from Duncan Rauch. Are there big energy user, user companies wishing to support renewable energy? I wonder if Shane might want to uh, kick off with that and then, and then uh, Ellen might want to jump in after. I think the answer to that, Tim, from our experience has been that all the companies we've contracted have not been the traditional big energy companies in Australia. It's been companies like NEO and who've come from Europe uh, and have really pioneered the development of wind power in Australia particularly, uh, but also solar to an extent. Uh, the sort of the traditional big players in the Australian market make noises about doing these things, but they have not been the real innovators in the space in, my, in our experience here in the ACT. Um, you know, the other, I was just going to make the observation on the previous conversation about thermal efficiency as well. It's such a good point, and I want to reinforce that. Even though we're now at 100% renewable electricity in the ACT, we've not dumped the energy efficiency stuff. We need to keep doing it for a range of reasons. Not only, uh, you know, it reduces household energy bills, it makes people's lives more pleasant because you live in a more comfortable home. Uh, and, you know, we don't want to have to go out and procure even more renewables just to sort of, because everyone can suddenly go, oh, we're renewables, we can use whatever we like. There's still a cost. To that and so including grid upgrades and stuff so the energy efficiency side of the equation remains extremely important it's a great job creator and it's got a terrific payback period on it so definitely all those comments about energy efficiency i completely agree with um i, I might move on unless ellen wants to jump in on this one um the uh, bev bev dick in I think Murrindindi and Jack Brady in Hobson's Bay are both asking about how to put pressure on their councils. Um, so Hobson's Bay obviously, uh, like all Victorian councils, has an election coming up in October. Uh, and I don't know when Murrindindi is next up for election, but uh, Bev asks, um, is a climate emergency declaration just a bit too extreme for the average ratepayer? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, I'm happy Trent. to take that and then hand over to Trent. So Murrindindi yeah. should be going to election at the same time as everyone else, which is this October. Um, so the good thing is that almost every year we have an election, which is an opportunity to put pressure on our lawmakers to do better and to do the kinds of things that Trent and Shane have been talking about. Uh, we have council elections this October right across Victoria. This is an excellent opportunity 
who ask the candidates in your area who are running, what will they do when it comes to climate change? And if they know that residents are asking them and if they need to get elected, then they need to do something about climate change. That's just the best opportunity to make change. I also know the ACT is up for election and Shane has just announced and launched their Greens campaign up there, which is all about a Green New Deal and building a better normal. And he might want to talk about that, but that's an incredible opportunity if you're up in the ACT to get involved in that campaign because what we've seen is that where Greens have been able to get elected, we've been able to make change. And that's where we're in government, in places like Darabin and the ACT, and also in places where we're not in government, but we're in opposition and we're working with the government or holding the government's feet to the fire in places like Victoria. We've been able to get incredible change already. So I personally think the reason I'm in politics is because of climate change. I was a climate activist working for the AYCC and other organisations before I got into politics. I got into politics because I think it is the best way to actually push for change on these things. And rather than just sitting around and getting depressed about the Prime Minister and his gas buddies and his fossil fuel buddies, I thought, let's do something about it. And if you're depressed about what's happening at a federal level, get involved at a local or state level, because actually there's a lot of really exciting things happening, but we can't do it without volunteers. So people to donate, people to make calls, people to uh, get involved at a local level, to do letterboxing, to put up core flutes, all of these things are needed this year. Thanks, Ellen. Trent, do you want to jump in at this point? Uh, look, um, probably just to add that um, I, I did show a couple of slides before about the work that we're doing connecting all the climate emergency councils together. And in speaking with those councils, you have every version of the, of, of the story. You have cases where it's um, a community-led campaign that calls upon the council to act um, despite what other levels of government may or may not be doing. Um, and in some cases, they're very conservative councils. So we've had councils like Stonington and Glen Ira who have um, you know, a much more liberal kind of bent who've actually declared a climate emergency because of the community pressure. And now what, what's happening is that people like myself are reaching out to them and saying, right, you've made this declaration. This is, the, this is the course of action that it actually requires. It means talking about the system change. It actually talks about supporting the most vulnerable, vulnerable people in your community. It's about working in partnership with First Nations people um, to understand how to actually connect, reconnect with land um, and actually live in harmony with our natural environment. So there's a whole amazing piece of work around this and it's an international movement. It is the fastest growing movement um, in the world within governments. It started here um, in, uh, in Melbourne and uh, it's something that we're all proud of. But I would just say, and I did see a question before about the term emergency. Um, this is a term which I know for some people in a, uh, an, an environment where there have been natural emergencies or natural disasters, I completely sympathise with some sensitivity. I used to work at CFA, so I understand the, the, what that language means. But what we also say is that in, this is an emergency situation that we face with climate change. And um, as, as climate activists will tell us, if you see the fire on the horizon, do you turn and face it and, and, and make preparations to keep your community safe or do you ignore it? So we, we're not up for ignoring it, we're up for taking action and keeping people safe. And, uh, and really trying to have a positive future, which is what this Green New Deal conversation is really about. Thank you, Trent. Now, um, I'd like to uh, thank everybody for all your questions, and but I just noticed that we're getting pretty close to wrap up time now. There have been a bunch of questions about the Green New Deal and jobs. I wonder, Ellen, if you wanted to squeeze in a 30 second concluding statement on that theme, uh, and, and then we'll wrap up. And I might pass to Shane, but... Um this will create a lot of jobs and in particular in construction and the kind of hard hat type jobs, but there's also lots of jobs that aren't in those sectors. So if you think about energy efficiency, um, you need people to answer the phones to, to take the bookings and then you need people to go and do the energy efficiency. Um, so there's a lot of jobs across many different sectors in not just the building the solar plants, but in running them, keeping them going and, and also the energy efficiency. It's a wonderful job creator. Yeah, I'll just jump in on that, Ellen, and you're right. I mean, as I showed before in some of the stats I provided, there's definitely jobs in this. Uh, there's a range of them, and they're, they're jobs that will last into the future, and we know that things like the coal sector have got a limited history. One thing we're really conscious of is we're thinking about both coming out of the COVID recession and as putting our version of a Green New Deal together with development for the ACT is the gender lens across it. Uh, too much of the work that's been done is, and Ellen touched on the hard hat stuff, we need those jobs but we're conscious of sort of some of the gender biases in some of those industries. And so we need to also 
be thinking about those elements as we build up a post-COVID recovery plan. Wonderful. All right, well, look, um, this has been a, a, a great presentation. Uh, thank you very much to our three panelists, Trent McCarthy, from a councillor from the city of Darabin, Ellen Sandell, Greens, Victorian Green spokesperson for climate and energy and member for Melbourne, Shane Rattenbury, Greens MP in the ACT state government. Uh, thank you so much for coming down uh, virtually and sharing with us what you've achieved up there. Uh, so that's been splendid. Before uh, you all go, everybody, uh, we'd, we'd love to get a, a, a group photo. And this is, I like this kind of Zoom group photo because the short people can stand wherever they want. So make sure your cameras are on uh, and stare at the camera, smile and wave, as they say in Madagascar. And, um, and I, hopefully our tech team have, uh, have got a snap of us all beaming, showing off our dentition. And um, so we've got a, a little bit more to ask from you. We're not quite over yet. We'd really love you to take our Green New Deal for Victoria survey. So the link is appearing in the comments, uh, hopefully now. Um, and please sign our petition, which our tech team will put in the chat. So as Ellen has already said, we've done a great deal of work uh, consulting, but uh, getting your opinions by these polls, the questions you've asked, uh, and further comments uh, has, has been very important and we'll be paying close attention to what we learn from this. Uh, we're a grassroots party. Um, what's different between us and, and some other uh, perhaps larger and better known parties uh, that we're driven by our membership. And so we need to hear your ideas. Um, and you can also get in touch on the email address that should be appearing in the chat box shortly. Um, so thanks again for joining us, spending your lunch hour with us. And a special thanks once more to Shane, Trent and Ellen. And, uh, and ring the bells, Shane. Thanks very much. See ya. <laughs>